The Poaceae plant family, this is the grass family. The phonetic spelling is below the word grass there, Poaceae, previously known as the Graminiae, uh, because these graminoids is another word for grasses. And it was renamed when uh, somebody decided that all plant families should end in ACA, similar to the Brassicaceae used to be called the Cruciferae, and they got renamed also. Some characteristics of the Poaceae. This is a monocot family, so parallel leaf veins, flower parts in threes. Some of them are warm season and some are cool season. I will go into that later. They have hollow stems for the most part, and that hollow stem is called a culm, C-U-L-M. They are not completely hollow. There are plugs at the nodes, which are growth areas. The nodes are where the leaves come off. They are generally long and narrow, as you would expect in a monocot. These uh, virtually always have fibrous root systems, sometimes extremely deep, like our prairie roots uh, tend to be 15, even 20, 30 feet deep in some cases. They often uh, multiply or spread with um, uh, stolons or rhizomes, which are both uh, specialized stems. The, uh, I'll go into more on that in the next slide. The flowers in general are arranged in uh, flor inflorescence called a spikelet. They are wind pollinated, so they're not trying to attract insects, so they're not um, going to smell especially unique, uh, especially strongly, and uh, there's no, uh, no fancy floral uh, display to attract anything. The fruit is technically called a caryopsis. This is an extremely economically important family they, for our grains, for hay and fodder, lawns, fiber production, ethanol production, and uh, horticultural usages. Here are a couple images of typical members of the Poaceae. On the left is a drawing with um, uh, showing you the blades and the stolon and the rhizome. You can see the stolon is um, above ground and the rhizome is below ground. And those are both modified stems. This picture, the tillers are labeled incorrectly. The tillers should be the two little green um, subplantlets on each side that have uh, resulted from a rhizome or a stoler. The crown of the plant is uh, the, the ground level um, area of the um, original plant. You can see on the right um, a little bit greater detail. They're showing you again rhizome and stolon. Um, and you can also see the, the blow up of the leaf there with a swollen node and, uh, showing you where the comb is and the collar which is where the uh, sheath uh, s separates from surrounding the stem and uh, the blade begins. There's also often a frequently a small little piece of tissue that's called a ligule right at the um, uh, interface of the comb and the blade. Taxonomy of this family, it's a very large family, over 10,000 species, making it the fifth largest plant family of uh, those that have been uh, sliced and diced by the taxonomists of the world. It does not include sedges or rushes. Um, it is in the Poales plant order. And the, f the family Poaceae is, uh, has 12 subfamilies, which you can imagine by the time you get 700 genera, and there's going to be a lot of um, uh, relationships and then less closely related family, uh, plants. Uh, on the plant evolutionary tree, you can see where we are in the monocots. Over there on the left, I've circled the Poales family. Notable species, as I already mentioned, this is the most economically valuable plant family of uh, any that we have. Uh, not the least of which it produces wheat, rye, rice, barley, oats, maize, sugarcane, uh, sorghum, and also bamboo, which is used for a lot of different um, uh, reasons. And then our lawn grasses, Kentucky bluegrass, bent grasses, uh, and also uh, much of our prairie species are grasses. Warm season versus cool season. You'll see that come up a lot when you study grasses that is uh, similar to you think of summer and flower crops or flowers, you know, the spring flowers that come up and then, uh, uh, you know, pretty much die out by the time it gets, gets hot would be cool season. And then things that like to grow during or are, are almost dormant until it does get hot are called warm season. In grasses, that's um, uh, a very strong distinction between them. And so generally the cool season are like our lawn grass, you see it, uh, very active in spring and fall, and then generally dormant in the hot months. Although, of course, uh, many people water their grass to keep it from going dormant, like a normal cool season grass would. 
Uh, warm season species are slower to establish. They have much deeper roots, which is what allows them to get through that hot, dry uh, August uh, warm season. And uh, many of our prairie species are indeed warm season grasses. Some example, examples of edible Poaceae and the cereal grains, it's uh, almost uh, hard to um, uh, summarize. They, um, this includes what wheat, wheat, rye, barley, rice, corn. Corn is called maize by almost all of the world except uh, the U.S. In uh, most uh, countries, corn would be any kind of grain. So corn or maize, oats, sorghum, and millet are just a few of the um, cereals. They are, however, probably some of the most uh, predominant ones. Note that uh, quinoa and amaranth are um, being used a lot as grains these days, but they are not grasses, and so they are considered pseudo-grains in this, um, this classification. Um, cereals um, are, uh, the word cereal came from Cirrus, the Roman god of agriculture, which gives you some idea of how long it's been then uh, these crops have been cultivated at least 12,000 years since uh, people started intentionally growing these and possibly longer. Uh, about 70% of all crops are grasses, and uh, the big three being wheat, rice, and corn. They provide about half of the calories eaten by humans on the earth, and 2.2 uh, billion metric tons were produced in 2010, a metric ton being 2,200 pounds, so uh, just think how many zeros would be there if we had uh, that calculated out up into the trillions of pounds. In the U.S., about 88 million acres of corn was planted uh, just in 2010. And that averages about 13 billion bushels of, um, uh, of corn per year, about 40% of which is used for ethanol, although, of course, uh, the estimates for that vary quite widely. Uh, most of these plants are annuals, so they are replanted yearly, which can be unfortunate when it leads to a lot of erosion and uh, additional cost of pulling the tractors through the fields over and over. And uh, as a food source, they do tend to lack lysine, which is an essential amino acid in the proteins, and which is why uh, they are frequently eaten with uh, legumes, which uh, tend to have plenty of lysine. In Iowa, you can't hardly talk about the Poaceae unless we talk about corn. Again, corn is called maize by about everybody except uh, folks in the U.S. It originated from a, a line of uh, species called teosinte in uh, Central American civilizations uh, were the first to notice and use this uh, as a crop. You can see on the upper right there, the, the small little grain head on the, the left is uh, sort of the primordial teosinte, and the one in the middle is sort of the early days of um, um, selection and hybridization, and then, of course, on the far right is a, what we think of as a typical ear of corn. The um, uh, Mesoamerican civilizations, like the Mayas and the Aztecs, and um, Teotihuacan, I believe is how that's pronounced, uh, and many others uh, from Central America were the first to cultivate and use these crops. It spread through the Americas by 2500 uh, BC, and today, of course, is uh, very widely grown. Our sweet corn and our field corn are both uh, originated from this, this line. The distinction between those two being the field corn generally has um, a lot of starch in it, whereas sweet corn uh, stores its, um, its sugars as sugar rather than linking them together in a starch. So if you were to go out into um, you know, what you see as a farmer's field that's under with a lot of corn in it, uh, you'd be pretty unhappy if you tried to eat that corn because it's very starchy, it's not sweet, whereas our sweet corns are, um, are a different line but the same plant. In uh, grass, uh, corn is indeed a great big grass plant. The tassel at the top is the male flower, which uh, produces pollen, and the ears are the female fl 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 flower. The silks are the stigma and style, and uh, each silk, each little single thread of silk is, is lined within that uh, ear to one single kernel of corn. Each, each kernel has its own silk and uh, is dependent on that silk being pollinated before that kernel can be produced. So in years when pollination is poor because it's either too dry or it's gotten really windy just as the silks came out, or um, a cold snap, there's a lot of different things can damage those silks, you get very irregular, irregular development of the kernels on the ear. And in the lower right, you can see some examples of um, 
years when obviously quite a bit went wrong when those uh, ears were filling. They fill from the bottom up. So like in the second and the third, well, the one in the middle and the one um, second from the left, obviously something was, was really wrong when the first uh, silks were being produced. But at the very end, some, they must have gotten rain or they got warm temperatures or something. And so a few uh, silks were able to um, get pollinated successfully and set uh, a kernel. Uh, Sugarcane is um, a very important world crop. The, by weight, it is the largest crop. Uh, the 1.7 billion metric tons produced in 2010 relative to corn, a mere 817 million metric tons. So um, millions more tons of sugar crop, sugar cane produced than corn annually. There are um, quite a few species, depending on what system you want to talk about, uh, of, of sac saccharum, saccharum species. The commercial lines that are used for production are hybrids of uh, numerous um, species. So they're uh, very difficult to identify genetically. They can be up to 19 feet tall. Uh, these species are very efficient at photosynthesis. So they are um, highly e effective at um, sucking up the sun and little water and producing a lot of biomass. They're tropical. They won't tolerate frost uh, much at all. So the main countries that grow these are uh, Brazil, India, and the warmer parts of China. But it is grown in about 90 different countries. They estimate 59 million acres are uh, covered with this crop, which is less than corn, but the crop is heavier. So uh, it's another one of those how do you define large uh, situations. And 80% uh, of the sugar in the world that's produced is from sugar cane. But they also um, produce molasses. And then when that is uh, distilled, it becomes rum, or fermented, it becomes rum. And ethanol, a lot of ethanol produced from sugar cane, a product called bargas which is the uh, biomass left after the sugar is extracted, is used for energy production, and uh, many other sugar products. Uh, this, this species was first domesticated 6 to 8,000 years ago. The Greeks called them reeds that produce honey without bees. Some horticultural examples of the Poaceae. There are quite a few grasses, obviously, that are used for landscaping. The Penicetum is a very popular one. It's not native to the US. Here's two examples, creatively called red dwarf and white dwarf. Lawn grass is the biggest use of horticultural um, species of Poaceae. There's a lot of different species used in lawn grasses. The blue grasses, Bermuda grass, bent grass. I think I read there was over 60 different species used. Uh, having lawns in the United States began in the early 1800s. It was uh, mimicking the English landscaping, where it was very labor intensive and therefore was a sign of wealth. And uh, one thing everyone kind of missed is we have a very different climate here than in England. So not only is it labor intensive, but it's also input intensive to maintain that uh, verdant, beautiful, cool season grass growing happily all summer long. It has evolved into an industry, the turf grass industry in the U.S. It's estimate, in the U.S. It's estimated to be $35 billion, uh, passing, changing hands just in 2004. It is the second largest seed crop in the U.S. And estimates are, the EPA estimates are $6.4 billion a year spent in the U.S. on lawn care. There are non-native species. It's essentially no cases of native grasses being used for lawns. So of course, uh, there, it means that native species have been displaced in order for this uh, lawn mo monocultures to be maintained. Hard to say exactly how many, but estimates range from 25 to 40 million acres of lawn in the US. It is our largest irrigated crop. And again, estimates hard to find, but uh, some, some estimates are as many as 30 million ir irrigated, ir irrigated acres in the US, which is three times more than our corn acreage that gets irrigated. When it is irrigated, it's uh, up to 200, or usually 200 gallons of water used per person per day to um, irrigate that, that crop across the United States. And remember, that's drinking water quality. So the water is purified to be safe for humans and then uh, uh, used to keep your lawn fresh. In some cases, 50 to 70% of residential water used is for landscaping irrigation. 
In the U.S., we have about 50 million lawnmowers that were not regulated until 1997 for fuel efficiency. And even so, they are using 800 million gallons of gas a year. One uh, side point there, it's estimated that 17 million gallons are spilled annually in the process of refueling lawnmowers, which is 50% more than the Exxon Valdez oil spill. Additionally, fertilizers, pesticides, and weed killers that are applied to grasses are very commonly used at residential rates, far higher than farmers would do. Golf courses and um, park systems that have to um, be a little more careful to their bottom line are not so likely to overapply, but uh, people working on their backyards aren't, uh, aren't usually under such a budget crunch that um, um, a little extra fertilizer or a little extra uh, weed killer uh, isn't going to break the family budget. Its EPA estimates 70 million pounds of active pesticide ingredients are used every year in the U.S. There is some movement against this in Canada in particular, Quebec and 130 different cities around Canada um, prohibit use of synthetic lawn sides and they prohibit lawn pesticides and they prohibit the use of cosmetic lawn pesticides. I like that, com that word, uh, cosmetic pesticide use, indicating that, you know, if you're growing a farm or a garden, it's one kind of perhaps reasons for using a pesticide, but if you're just trying to make your lawn pretty, it's just cosmetic. Some examples in Iowa. Um, our native prairie here that we used to have, mostly gone, uh, the dominant species were grasses. There were many, many, many other um, species. There's about a thousand species native to Iowa, but as far as the uh, uh, major biomass in prairies, it was grass. Uh, in Iowa, there's probably 30 different uh, members of the Poaceae, but six um, predominant ones are big blue stem, Indian grass, switchgrass, little blue stem, side oats, grama, and uh, the drop seeds. There's northern drop seed and sand drop seed and um, uh, one other species I can't think at the top of my head. So the pictures I have for you here on the upper left is big blue stem. It's often also called turkey foot, and you can see they look a little bit like turkey feet. Upper right is Indian grass. Lower right is side oats grama, named because it looks like little oats hanging to the side. It's, um, it's not in the oat genus. And uh, finally, little blue stem in the lower left, which is uh, just really blue during the summer, and then it turns a beautiful rust color in the fall. Non-native Iowa poaceae, reed canary grass. Uh, this is one invasive species. Uh, there is a native reed canary. Um, this one that has been widely planted as a forage uh, is extremely aggressive. It takes over any um, area where it is, basically, but especially if there's any excess mo uh, moisture. It, um, it establishes itself. Uh, it's very dense. It's very tall. It shades out everything that used to be there, so it chokes out anything native. It's not good habitat, and it's extremely difficult to get rid of. Um, you can see three different pictures there of it having uh, taken over an understory. And the guy in the lower left is Kings Canyon in California, so it's not just a problem to Iowa. And there's a picture of the inflorescence on the left. Toxicity, not too much problems with, uh, with the Poaceae, although there are cases of horses and cattle that have grazed on stressed grasses that are thought to produce uh, cyanogenic glycosides, glucosides, when they get under uh, drought stress. And uh, these have, uh, have killed cattle and horses. Um, there are more problems happen when the animals eat some of the more bristly seed heads that can cause intestinal problems with the, the bristles lodging or causing irritation um, intestinally. And then one uh, Iowa, we have prairie cordgrass, and uh, there are some other grasses also that are so rough on the edges that they cause skin damage just to uh, brush against them. And rip gut has been named for the damage that it does to uh, cattle that are uh, walking in sloughs and places that have a lot of prairie cord grass. For a little more information, of course, there's Wikipedia. It has pages on the Poaceae, on corn, on sugar cane, various other uh, Poaceae species. And then in general, there's a nice wildflowers and weeds spot that has uh, a lot on the Poaceae. So that concludes the overview of the family, grass family, Poaceae.